Hi everybody, today we're going to look at section 3.4. We're not going to do really the whole section, we're just going to look at a couple of concepts. We're going to talk about the intermediate value theorem and the boundedness theorem. So here we go. Now before we get started with our two theorems that we're going to look at in this section, let's kind of remember some important relationships that we've been learning throughout this chapter. If we have a number c that is a zero of f of x, that means that f of c equals zero. We learned that that's what the definition of zero is. It means that when you plug that number in, the function value is zero. It also means that the graph of f of x would have an x-intercept at c. And it means that c is a solution of the equation f of x equals zero. And another word for solution is root, so sometimes we'll say that c is a root of the equation f of x equals zero. And it also means that x minus c is a factor of f of x. So let's look at the intermediate value theorem first. This says if f of x is a polynomial function with only real coefficients, and if for real numbers a and b the values f of a and f of b are opposite in sign, then there exists at least one real zero between a and b. Now let's go back and think about what this is saying for a second. If f of x is a polynomial function, well you know that polynomials can only have positive whole number exponents. And if we know that we have real coefficients on a polynomial function, then the graph of that polynomial function is going to be a nice, smooth, continuous curve. Now here I've drawn just a little piece of a polynomial function graph, and I've labeled two x values on the x-axis, a and b. Now f of a would be here. The y value when x equals a is here. And so that's f of a, and you can see that it's a negative y value. And at b, my function value is here, so you can see that f of b is a positive y value. Now if f of a is negative and f of b is positive and the curve is continuous, then you know that somewhere in between a and b, there had to be a function value equal to zero. In other words, there has to be a place between a and b where the function crosses the x-axis. Now it says that if the function values have a change in sign, it means that there exists at least one real zero between a and b. There could be more than one zero. Take a look at this function, and I'll just mark an a and a b here and here, so that f of a is negative again, and f of b is positive, but look, this time there are three x-intercepts. So there doesn't have to be just one, there can be more than one, but if there's a change in sign, you're guaranteed at least one. Now let's look at example five, which says use synthetic division and the intermediate value theorem to show that f of x has a real zero between two and three. Well, we know that the intermediate value theorem says that if f of 2 and f of 3 have different signs, then there is at least one zero between 2 and 3. Now, we could evaluate f of 2 and f of 3 by just plugging 2 and 3 into our function, but it says use synthetic division. So that's going to be our remainder theorem. So let's run 2 through our synthetic division process, and it says that when we do 2, and it says that f of 2 is equal to negative 1. So now let's do the 3. We'll run the 3 through our synthetic division process, and we find out that f of 3 is 7. Okay, now we can just say that since f of 2 is one sign and f of 3 is the opposite sign, somewhere in between 2 and 3 there's a 0. Since f of 2 is negative and f of 3 is positive, there is at least one point between 2 and 3 where f of x equals 0. Now you have to be careful how you think about the intermediate value theorem. I want to make sure you understand. We know that if f of a and f of b are opposite in sign, there's at least one 0 between a and b. However, if they are not opposite in sign, that doesn't mean there's no 0 between a and b. Take a look at this function here. Here's a, and that means that this is f of a, and here's b, so this is f of b, 
And notice that they're both negative, but notice that the function crosses over the x-axis and comes back. So just because they're the same sign doesn't mean there are no zeros. It's just that if they're different signs, we're guaranteed at least one zero. If they're the same sign, it doesn't tell us anything about the number of zeros. Now here's one you can practice on. So if you'd like to pause the video and try it by yourself, this is a good time to do that. And now I'll go through it with you. It says use synthetic division to show that this function has a real zero between zero and one. Well, we know that if we can show that the function values of 0 and 1 are different in sign, we know that we're guaranteed at least one real 0 between 0 and 1. So let's do the synthetic division with 0 in the box, and that's going to give us a function value of 7. And so we know that f of 0 equals 7, and now if we do the synthetic division with 1 in the box, then we find out that f of 1 equals negative 1. And so if f of 0 is positive and f of 1 is negative, it means that somewhere between 0 and 1, the function crossed the x-axis. So there's at least one 0 between 0 and 1. And finally, for this section here is the boundedness theorem. Now this theorem has a lot of conditions, but if you'll think through it, I think you'll understand it. It's not a difficult thing to use. This is called the boundedness theorem. It says, let f of x be a polynomial function of degree greater than or equal to 1 with real coefficients and with a positive leading coefficient. So the leading term must have a positive coefficient. Now it says, also suppose f of x is divided synthetically by x minus c. So you've got c in the box of your synthetic division. If c is positive, and all the numbers in the bottom row of the synthetic division are non-negative, that is, zero or more, then f of x has no zeros larger than c. And here's the second part. It says if c is negative, and the numbers in the bottom row of the synthetic division alternate in sign, with zero considered positive or negative as needed, then f of x has no zero less than c. Now let's try this out. Here is example six. It says show that the real zeros of f of x satisfy these conditions. And the first one is that f has no real zero greater than three. So we'll do the synthetic division with three in the box. And we'll just run through this. Now we know that 3 is not a 0 because f of 3 is 37. But the question is, is it possible for there to be any zeros greater than 3? And the boundedness theorem says no. Since we divided by x minus 3, and 3 is positive, and the bottom row of numbers came up entirely positive, that tells us that f of x has no zeros larger than 3. That's all the boundedness theorem tells you. It tells you that if you have a positive c in the box and the leading coefficient is positive and the bottom row comes up all non-negative, that is 0 or positive, then there will be no zeros past this number. And the time when it's going to be most helpful to know this is if you have a large list of p over q numbers that you're trying to dig through, you might like to know when you can stop trying any numbers beyond the one that you've tried last. So in this case, you would know that there's no sense in trying any numbers larger than 3. Now let's look at part B of example 6, which has the same polynomial and asks us to show that there are no real zeros for this polynomial less than negative 1. Now remember, we can show that there are no real zeros less than a negative number, or we can show that there are no real zeros more than a positive number. Here we're working on showing that there are no real zeros less than negative 1. So we will lay out our coefficients. We will put negative 1 in the box and go through the synthetic division process. And now notice that we know negative 1 is not a 0 because f of negative 1 is equal to 5. But the question is, are there any zeros less than negative 1? Well, let's see. If we have a negative c 
and the signs on the bottom row alternate. Let's see, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. Then we are guaranteed that there are no real zeros less than negative one. And by the way, if they didn't alternate, then the most we could say is we're not guaranteed whether there are any zeros less than negative one. It wouldn't prove that there are any, it just would not let us prove that there aren't. Now here are a couple of practice problems for you, and if you would like to pause the video and try this on your own, then go ahead and do that. And now I'm going to go through them with you. This one says, show that this function has no real zero greater than one. So we can do that using the boundedness theorem. Remember the requirements of the boundedness theorem. We're required to have a positive leading coefficient. And then if C is positive, which it is here, we can look for all non-negatives on the bottom row. And if we get all non-negatives, then we'll know that there are no real zeros greater than one. So let's try it. We'll put down our coefficients, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 constant, and then we'll put 1 in the box, go through the synthetic division process, and because C is positive, and because the bottom row is all positive, there are no real zeros greater than 1. And the last one says show that f of x has no real zero less than negative 2. Okay, so we can use the boundedness theorem to show that there are no real zeros less than a negative number. And what we'll be looking for is in our synthetic division bottom row, we want to see alternating signs. So let's lay out our coefficients and do the synthetic division. And we have here positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. And therefore, since C is negative and the bottom row alternates signs, there are no zeros less than negative 2. That's it. Now, I know that the two theorems we talked about in this section are very abstract. You really can't see or touch anything. There's no real world anything you can relate to. But these are just strictly exercises in logic for you. If you'll go back and read the theorems and think about what they're saying, neither one of them is hard to use, but just like any game that you play, you have to know the rules to know when you've won the game. So read the theorems, think about what they're saying, and practice with them, and I think you'll see that neither one of them is very difficult. Don't be intimidated by either one of these theorems.